No, it's the style now to talk about Henry's tyranny. Here's despotism. But despotism needs effectual means of control. And much of Henry's reign was a battle for control. A battle simply to make his writ run, to make the law operate equally in every part of the kingdom. I don't think it gets us very far to talk about Henry as if he was Stalin or any other dictator of the 20th century, uh, because he did not have 20th century means of communication or control. And to rule effectively, he did need the cooperation of his subjects. The people inside a castle can defend themselves against the world, but they also live in unity. They have to help each other. Everyone's in it together. Or to put it another way, community of interest is the key to a successfully defended populace. Now, in the decade of the 1530s, Thomas Cromwell and his circle of thinkers, they're often known as the Commonweal men, which meant they took as the object of their thought the general welfare. The Commonweal men came up with a series of plans which, if implemented, would have changed the face of the nation and made over customs and habits of mind, as well as laws. Anyone who studied history with G.R. Elton or K. Hundry's influence will know all about these plans. Elton was, of course, the great valorizer of Thomas Cromwell, and he formed a whole generation of Tudor scholars. And when any man has been so preeminent, well, his sons have to rise up and kill him. So more than one generation of scholars have now found it necessary to define themselves as against Elton. And so it's been contended that what Elton called the Tudor revolution in government wasn't very revolutionary at all. And researchers have stressed quite properly in some cases continuity with medieval institutions, and they've made a case that most of Thomas Cromwell's measures weren't principled or intellectually determined, but they were ad hoc responses to circumstances. <coughs> but because academic fashion has turned, we shouldn't forget what an interesting decade the 1530s were. We, we're in danger of forgetting this quick fading but very real strand of English radicalism. Historians have characterised Cromwell as a great administrator, but I think he was more of a great innovator. Elton wrote, wherever one touches him, one finds originality and the unconventional. And his most persistent trait was a manifest dissatisfaction with things as they were. He remained all his life a questioner and a radical reformer. <coughs> now, by the time Henry was building his fortifications, Thomas Cromwell had been his counsellor for about eight years. And it was he who would cast the break with Rome into legislation, made it a practical reality. He joined the King's Council in the wake of the fall of Cardinal Wolsey, who had been his first patron. But let me talk a little about who Cromwell was, because it's not a usual story. His political career is, of course, well documented, but his private life barely makes it onto the record. Much of his early life is a mystery. He was born in Putney. His father was a brewer and a blacksmith, and there was a family interest in a fulling mill. So the Cromwells were not poor, but I think today we regard them as dysfunctional. The only reason we know anything about the circumstances of Thomas Cromwell's early life are that his father, Walter the blacksmith, was always in court. Um, criminal charges of assault and drunkenness and all sorts of civil suits. He was the neighbour from hell. And half year without fail at the assize of ale he was fined for watering his beer um, and all that's left of us by way of Cromwell's own account of his early life is a laconic remark to Archbishop Cranmer 
I was a ruffian in my youth. Now it's believed that he ran away when he was about 15, across the channel, and became a mercenary fighting in the French <coughs> army. Seems to have been present at one major battle at least. And I suppose then he learned the price of himself and the value of himself from the gap in between. Uh, because somehow he left soldiering and he crops up in northern Italy, working for the merchant banks. And he's seen in Florence, Venice, Rome. He crops up in Antwerp and at the cloth fairs in the Low Countries. He's acting as a factor in the wall trade. 